I've, I've recently got a project funded in collaboration with CQ and the BBC, Continuum and the BBC. Um, and obviously I'm from UCL, so I thought maybe it's better if I talk about an aphora and ellipsis resolution using quantum methods in the context of the bigger picture of our project. And so, um, so I've listed all the students who've helped me and hopefully Shashvat will also start next, next year. Um, and some of, most of them are here actually in the room and their names will come up later as well. And so this is a five year senior research fellowship by Royal Academy of Engineering. Sorry, <laughs> a little propaganda. Okay, so uh, I, I, I would like to sort of promote this project the same way as I did it to them. So, um, so the idea is that we live at the age of data. There is a lot of data around, there's good data. For example, the data that is collected by nurses daily, which apparently gets accumulated and nobody uses it. So there are, I would not have thought of this, but there are collaborations between nurses and mathematicians how to take advantage of this data automatically, properly. And there's obviously bad news, uh, fake news. And there's also a lot of ugly news, obviously, around the news we don't really want to know about. And a lot of initiatives to take advantage of the data, um, like on, on the umbrella of that uh, mathematicians and nurses collaboration, there is this new initiative by the NHS, uh, Data Save Lives. Okay, so uh, why is that related to us? I will, I'll try to motivate, so we send 100 million text messages uh, every minute. A third of our waking hours is spent streaming, average person, and we receive about 30 to 40 gigs of data every year. So obviously we get overloaded by this data. And uh, the data is obviously not managed properly. Everybody uses one way of streaming to spend time at home. And I'll show like one sample problem. Uh, so an example story, a recent, hopefully past pandemic. And I want to know more about it. So imagine I came from a country when there was no COVID-19 or even in the UK, I want to sort of know more about COVID-19. Is it related to any other past pandemics? Uh, how, how do I have to deal with it? But if I enter COVID-19 in the search option of iPlayer, I get unrelated data. It's really astonishing. Then let's try Netflix. Maybe they, they have more money, better budget. And if I put COVID-19 in the search item of Netflix, I also get unrelated content. Um, let's see. Hopefully I will survive. <laughs> and in fact, it's my Netflix feed is full of unrelated content. It's like, okay. Uh, my daughter uses my, my account, obviously, and you just, you just see popular on Netflix. That's the first one, it's just things that are popular, things that everybody likes. These are the things that may become popular, and these are the things that I w we watched in the past. So, so this relatedness of data doesn't come up at all. So, okay, so the idea behind this project the, the, was that the simplest type of this data is text, and in fact, when I was working with the BBC, I became aware that they have huge uh, archives of media. Imagine all the program that BBC ever produced on radio and television over these years. They actually have a record of it in there's these physical archives. I was given a tour at some point. And uh, most of it can be represented by text. So each of these TV and radio programs, they've got title, description, they've got synopsis, they got script, and these days you can just write, uh, run speech to text and get subtitles for them. And so why advances in natural language processing haven't been taken into account when searching these archives of data? So the search uh, option of Google works really well if I put Google COVID-19, it tries to sort of guess what do I want to know about COVID-19. So search works really well here. And uh, if I say, like, what do I say? Um, I even get what I wanted to uh, find out when I, wanted, when I went to iPlayer and Netflix, I really wanted related footage about COVID-19, which I did not get there, but I do get when I just search for COVID-19 in Google. 
due thanks to advances in NLP that Google takes, uh, knows about and other programs do not know. So that's, that's the idea. So we want to develop mathematical models to represent semantics of this textual data and code it in a software package and then use it to relate data. The specific te test case of this project is to generate media recommendations. You have to, to give ideas about things you want to watch in the future which are related to the things that you watched in the past. Uh, and obviously it goes very easily and immediately beyond media recommendations to any area that is, um, that has text heavy products, right? Okay. So, uh, I, I want to show how improvement in this area is immediately extremely possible. Mm -hmm. Take it. Okay, okay, so um, just by arranging the text um, that comes from the subtitles of the, the programs in very, a very slightly structured way. So the title of the project was, if you remember, was like engineering mathematics for modeling typed text structures. Which is, I wanted the acronym to be Emitis, so that's why I came up with that title. It's the second name of my daughter. <laughs> so uh, if you structure this text, instead of in vectors, in matrices. Uh, if you want to ask me later, I'll explain how do we put the text in matrices. Very, very simple procedure. So instead of just having a flat vector, you just arrange it in matrix and then run some kind of matrix similarity. That's important. What kind of similarity? What kind of operational matrix that you want to run to get a nice notion of similarity? then um, you immediately get a lift in the accuracy of, for example, BBC's recommender system, which we worked with. So I'll quickly give a run through. So we worked with two data sets. One was like a weekly data set of 146 programs. Then later, uh, we also got access to a monthly data set of 900 programs. So think about calculating program similarities between pairs of programs, like right? so 146 times 146 divided by two, and similarly for this 900, because you have to calculate similarities between every pair of programs in these data sets. And the idea is that, okay, you'll build not vector, obviously matrix representations for these uh, programs, such that things like surviving COVID and SARS, the true story, will become close to each other, and things like Voice UK and EastEnders, will be close to each other, and these will be somehow far away from each other in some plausible scenario. And these are our results. So, so in our model, the recommendations that you get in top, let's look at top 20. In top 20, the accuracy is 18%. It's a very low accuracy. Uh, but the baseline that the BBC had was only 12 so you see the raise of around 6% from 12 to 18, just by putting the subtotal files into matrix X. And if you don't put them in matrix X and just use doc 2 vec vectors, then you get 13.88. So look at the difference between. So from 12, you do get a raise to 13, but the story is very different if you go to matrices. Then, uh, well, well, maybe this data set is too small. And this is just, these results aren't reliable. It's just, it was just chance. Uh, so we tested on the monthly data set and uh, although the accuracies are quite low on the monthly data set in general, baseline is 2.6. The normal doc to vec model gives 3.2, but our model lifts it, lifts it to 4.14. If you want to know if these differences are statistically significant, they are very statistically significant because the data set is quite large, 900 times 900 divided by two. Okay, so, so this, is our, this is our target data set. Then uh, here are some examples. So if you look at so the life of rock by Brian Pan, so this is a, a, a BBC program, what BBC normally recommends to you is anything that's of type comedy spoof. So you get these things. But if you look at the recommendations that our program produced, you get all this top of the pop like programs, Story of 1979, Top of the Pops 2. You get Queens of Disco. 
you get Neil Sadaka, the king of song. They are all very relevant. Do you agree? <laughs> Do people agree this is relevant? It's also subjective relevance. Uh, similarly, if you look at wild China, um, these are the, the, what BBC uh, recommends to you is uh, all their nature and environment programs of the same genre. But if you look at what we come up with, you get like animal odd couples, because wild China is about wild animals in China, the lost kingdoms of South Africa, the Russia for wheels, et cetera, et cetera. So, you're right, okay. So now moving on, so we want to sort of like um, do a proper mathematical modeling of this kind of text. Obviously, uh, we, we want both a logical representation of the data, uh, so something like Lambert calculus for the grammatical structure within sentences, and then what we've been working with is actually not of a new idea, but piggybacking on ideas that were present a lot in the uh, communities add some kind of modalities to Lambert calculus to extend the expressive power, which would then enable you to move from sentence to kind of document structure, the structure, discourse structure that exists between sentences. So that's where anaphora and ellipsis comes in, any kind of core reference structure. Uh, and to this, well, as you saw, we want to add statistical information Normally, we would work with finite dimensional vector spaces, some kind of deep neural network embedding, dog to vec any BERT family embedding. But thanks to CQ and Bob's efforts, we also now have access to a methodology that would give us a different kind of statistical representation in the form of quantum circuits. So uh, I'll start by giving some kind of technical background. So this is Lambeck calculus from uh, 1958 paper of Lambeck, my max of sentence structure, uh, sequence calculus format. These are the left and right uh, implications, which come as residuations to your tensor product, which is non-commutative, highly non-commutative. On the left is just pretty printing for the comma of the sequence the list comma. On the right, you have to be very clever and divide your context into two separate things, comma one and comma two from one of them. You get the first uh, multiplicand, A, and from the other one, you have to take the second one. This is a very difficult rule in proof search. Now, what people have been doing for a long time, uh, starting from Moril and Mortgott, and later on Jager, work of my PhD student, Heis Weinhold, and what Lachlan have been doing, uh, has been doing since 2021, I think, and our papers started from 2022. And when I was writing this, I didn't have space to add. CCG also has a model version, thanks to Jason Baldridge's work. I want to look at Steve. So that CCG also has a model version for, for very similar reasons. Uh, so the logic we ended up working with, so we changed perspectives quite a few times until we finally found the right logic, I'll, I'll explain why, is something called Lambda calculus with soft sub-exponentials, which is recent work of Max Kanovich and friends in each car 2020. So what they do is that you add modalities to the Lambda calculus space. Nobody actually stops you from adding more modalities. These logics can easily become multimodal. But at the moment, we've got a bang operator and a NABLA operator. NABLA makes you uh, permute. Permute things on the left and on the right. Um, so you can only permute types that you've marked with NABLAs. Bang is going to enable you have access to a banged type that is like a storage. So it's not like copying. We used to sort of work with copying things, which were in the right approach. But this approach says you've got a storage, some kind of a limit object, where you have a lot, a lot of copies of something. And then you can get access to those copies by applying this left rule, and you lose your bank. So it's a one-off application of the rule. You have a bank of A, you get n copies of A. Again, then not for any n. This n is bound from the high, from upper, limit by a k. So each 
So a lambda calculus with a soft. So exponential comes with a bound k, and these ends are variables that move between one, so there should be at least one copy, and that upper bound k of the logic. You can fix k to be 100 if you want. K and n can also be equal if you want. I'll say something about this later. And yeah, so this, this, this is like a projection operator. And the storage is something like a limit object in a category. It has all the copies in it. Okay. So as usual, to get vector space semantics, we give an interpretation to the formulae and sequence of this logic. I think people are familiar what it's done to the tensor. So the tensor of formulae goes to the tensor of the vector spaces you assign to the atoms, finite dimensional vector spaces that you assign to the atoms of the logic. Nabla is identity, left and right multiplications are also done using tensor and the dual operation. And now what is the bank? It's some kind of Fox space, but because we have an upper bound in the logic, not any Fox space, a Fox space that is truncated from above by the bound of the logic. So here you've got, obviously these cases are different, that's the field. Uh, so you've got one copy, two copies, three copies, and all the way up to K0 copies for the bound of logic, okay. So when in the previous slide I was, that rule is projection, and in fact, in reality, this is also the projections to the different layers of the Fox space. If you need A, you project to the first layer. If you need two copies of A, you go to the second layer, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, this logic has very good methodological properties, so it's decidable. All the logics we worked with before were undecidable. It doesn't have the cut rule, which makes proof search easy, but it has a theorem which says cuts are admissible. You need this for semantic reasons. If you need them, it has a strong normalization property. It's sound with regard to uh, this finite dimensional vector space semantics that we work with. And we also came up with a string diagrammatic calculus for it. Now, with regards to text analysis, very easily then you can talk about two sentences that are connected to each other via an anaphoric relation, for example. If you say, Andy slept, he snored, then you want to bang Nabla, the type of Andy, because you know that you have to move it so that it can get taken by the type of he, which is nabla n backslash n. He is something that either needs something nabla from before or after it, anaphora or cataphora. In this case, it's anaphora. You copy it, you not copy it, project it to the second layer, so you get two nabla n's. One is going to get cancelled with slap, the other one is going to get uh, moved to where he is, and then get cancelled with he, provide the subject for a snort. That's the general methodology. Similarly for Andy snores, none of us do. This is a, a case of ellipsis. This similar story, what you're projecting is your verb phrase here, so you bang nabla, the type of the verb phrase, snores and backwards slash s, then project and move. Any, we've worked with kind of complicated uh, examples. So the moment you talk about an Afro and ellipsis, like many natural language phenomena, you, uh, you'll face ambiguities. So here we've got structural ambiguities, like Philippa likes her dad, Ada does too. Who's that? If we're talking about A does that, then here's the proof tree. Um, if we're talking about Philippos that, Philippos likes say that, Ada also likes Philippos that, this is the proof tree. Luckily everything is automated, we don't have to do this. It's not, we don't have an automation. <laughs> okay, uh, you also have semantic ambiguities, which is the topic of this talk really. Uh, for example, you have, the dog broke the cat, it was clumsy, right? We as humans, because we have extra knowledge about the world, we know that it is referring to the dog, but if it was, the dog broke the cat, it was fragile, then it obviously refers to the vase. But machines don't know this very easily. 
but we, we provide different proof trees for these two interpretations. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so in the same way as you have different proof trees for these different interpretations, you also get different string diagrammatic semantics. So we start with the normal string diagrams, the vector space, the tensor of two spaces, then we introduce a new notation, like thick line, for the Fox space. We worked for a while to sort of decompose this Fox space because it's the direct sum of lots of tensors, but direct sum doesn't have nice diagrammatic notation. So we're just like, okay, for, mo for the moment, let's just put the thick line. In the same way as you have projection elements of a vector space, you also have elements of a Fox space in a very similar way. And uh, the linear maps that you had for uh, vector spaces, they, they also hold all of them for Fox spaces. In particular, we have a projection map, a special linear map. For Fox spaces, which is the projection, a thick line goes in, and then you can get access to whichever layer, nth layer of the Fox space. Now, a common operation that we will do in all of our examples is that you do the morphism that gives you access to an element of a Fox space. So this is an element of a Fox space, and then you project from it, right? So this is a very common operation. Again, we've got all the other maps, and here's an example. So we've got the dog broke the vase. It was clumsy. How you proceed? So this is the diagram of the proof tree. You, pre, uh, you have the element of the fox space, the dog. Remember, you bang up lot the dog. There was a bang by the type of the dog. Then you project to the second layer because you only need two copies in this example. You can't swap in vector spaces, so lines cross. Then you give one copy of the dog to broke, the other one to eat. Now you've got a nice diagram. And that's the diagram for the other interpretation. The dog broke the glass, it was fragile. Okay, so what about quantum circuits? Um, so we sort of use all the CQ toolkit. So we've got quantum circuits exactly the same as them. So that's like for a word, which has no tensors in it, just a vector space. If you have a tensor of two vector spaces, this is your quantum second, similarly for three and four. Uh, but unfortunately, as people probably are thinking, there is no quantum circuit counterpart for Fox spaces. Now, um, I was so happy when I came across this paper in quantum information branch of nature. Uh, people are trying to sort of have um, quantum circuit counterparts of Fox spaces, so maybe we can use this later, but for a time being, we remedied this problem by noticing what I was saying before, that the only operation we do with Fox spaces in the examples we've considered so far is that you go to the element of a Fox space and you project from it. And this operation can soundly be modeled just by a tensor of the, the projection layer you projected to. So here, if P is three, you can use this the rank two tensor. So we shorthand, if you want this, to such a trapezoid with n legs emanating from it. And obviously that has a corresponding quantum circuit. So then now we can draw quantum circuits for uh, different interpretations of the, these sentences. This is for one version, this is for the other version, and now I'll show the results of some experiments. So we want to use these circuits, obviously, and so resolve the anaphora, resolve the ambiguity that's present in the anaphora uh, by doing some learning on the quantum computers, right, and classically. So there are many different data sets available for these pronoun resolution cases. So we work with the one introduced by Rahman and NG in MLP 2012. Uh, which is a case of the Vinograd schema challenge. I'll say something about this a bit later. But as people, so that, that data set has 941 sentences. Uh, our data set only has 144. And we work with a very small subset of theirs. 
So the sentences are of the following form. The fish ate the worm, it was hungry. The girls ate the cookies, they were starving. Manu lost to Liverpool. They didn't play well. So these sentences should all cluster in the same part of the vector space, had we a vector space. And then the other sentences, Manu lost to Liverpool, they played well. The girls ate the cookies, they were delicious. The fish ate the worm, it was tasty, should cluster on the other side of the vector space. So this is the classification task. Sentences where the pronoun of the second sentence refers to the subject of the first sentence, and the sentence is where the pronoun of the second sentence refers to the object of the first sentence. So we run this as a classification task, and here are the results. When we work with these diagrams, because we have two sentences and there's two lines coming out of the diagram. Similarly, there'll be two lines coming out of the quantum circuit. And for classification, ideally, you need just one number, right? One probability distribution. Um, so we thought, had to think about how to join these two lines together. Obviously, one natural option in, in quantum circuits is the spider. So we join them with the spider. Uh, another option was you just join them with a the box. When you, you learn the parameters of that box to be learned by the quantum circuit. And it was really nice to see some differences between the accuracies. So what we learned, I don't know, may, we may be very wrong, is that if you run these models for long enough, uh, your error function will converge and your accuracy will go high. Is that true? Is that true? So, but if you then run the quantum model that we joined, the, the sentences with the spider, with the same parameters as with this box whose uh, of uh, parameters we learned with the same sort of values for the same amount of time, the convergence of the spider was much quicker, with much higher accuracy, somewhere close to 100%, between 90 and 100. But with the box, it became much lower, so around 80% accuracy, and the convergence is also not as low as the other case. So that's something we learned from this. And finally, our goal in this part of the project is to attack the Vinograd Schema Challenge, uh, which was suggested by Hector Levesque in 2011 as a rival to the Turing test. So he argued if you want to delineate humans from computers, this is a much better test than Turing test. So let's have a look at the first sentence. Police did not demonstrate this permit since they feared violence. Who feared violence? The police. Police did not demonstrate this permit since they advocated violence. Here, the demonstrators advocated violence. Humans can solve all these um, references. Machines cannot because they don't have access to world knowledge and common sense reasoning. So our goal is to try to solve the Vinogar Schema Challenge with high accuracy on the quantum computer. And then I finish by some future possibilities for extending this work. So why doing Vinograd Schema Challenge is not so easy. It, it has a large vocabulary, and the sentences have complex grammatical structures. So on the face of it, the quantum circuits that you get will be extremely noisy. Even if it's possible to get the right parse from an automatic parser, the quantum um, circuits will take a long time to train. Then when you join the sentences, okay, we've done the spider general box, um, but ideally it should really be a logical operation on the two probability distributions that come from each sentence. So it's, this is a big question for me. I don't know what should that logical operation be. Then we um, imitated the Fox space really using an element of Fox space that is entangled, like the general story. You could also work with separable states, and instead of having one big trapezoid, you could have three smaller ones. But why not n separate copies? When you project the nth layer of the Fox space, that was our shorthand. And then this was the projection where you get n lights. So this was our shorthand. So why not this one? 
I know in the past when we worked with similarity-based tasks, that wasn't a right option, but here we are classifying, so it should probably be okay. I wonder if we will have quicker convergence and higher accuracy, so probably we should try. Um, then the question is we've been so using DiscoPy to a large extent, but of course DiscoPy doesn't do anaphora resolution, so I'll, I can show what we've done and how this can be done properly. And obviously a big question from the beginning was how to use DiscoSec to model this kind of phenomena. I've got internship with several of my practitioners with CQ this summer, hopefully we'll attack these problems. And these are resources, we'll be writing a paper, hopefully it'll come out in the next couple of weeks. All the code is in a GitHub repository. And I've promised Royal Aquatic Engineering we're going to run uh, a same joint seminar with CQ. So hopefully that will happen. I just wanted to show. So if you put the cat, broke the valve, it was fragile, to disco cat, the disco pie diagram generator. This is the diagram that you get. Where is Alexis? Hello. <laughs> Fair enough. So it's connecting the vas to walls. Uh, which is completely okay because there is no discourse resolution structure here. Ideally, you would like it to be connected to the cat and the first and the second sentences to be disconnected otherwise, so it's not happening here. So we have a cheat version where, so this is our Disco X or Disco Pro version. So you have the girls broke the vase, it was fragile. Obviously, co-reference resolution is not a solved task parsing wise, so we connect them by hand. We say, uh, look, the reference of vas, the reference of the pro pronoun it is the vas. So we mention explicitly what is referring to what, but there are ideas of how to connect this into a neural co-reference resolution engine. And then you get the right diagram. So the fragile is the vas, so as you see, we work with this shorthand, that shorthand, here, yeah. got two copies of the bus coming out, and correctly, it, one copy goes to it. And the two sentences are disconnected otherwise, right? So you have two sentence lines coming out of the diagram. So that's the idea. It can be done in a much more general version. And finally, Was I playing there? Uh, I, will, I would like to conclude just in one minute, maybe. Um, this is what I want to say. Okay, so the conclusion, so the ethos is obviously, when you want to reason about text, you have to consider both structure, so the logical structure, and data statistics. So the contributions of this line of research is that we want to extend the existing unified mathematics framework, the DiscoCAD framework, from uh, sentence level, grammar to document level, discourse, and we take advantage of CQ's initiative and use both real valued vector spaces and complex valued vector spaces using quantum. What we've done so far, the results and novelty is that we use Fox space semantics for lambda calculus, we improve the accuracy of the VCs R and commander system with not much structure into account yet. And we've got convergence with high accuracy on a simplified version of a program pronoun resolution task. There is a lot that can be done on the theoretical level, and I know this is not necessary and absolutely not needed for the linguistic applications. Still, I'm, I would like to find a complete model for this model Lambda calculi is an open theoretical problem. Convergence on Winograd schema challenge on a quantum computer would be a nice practical thing to do. Uh, commercialization would be really nice. We will all get some more money if you can really use these quantum circuits to predict um, recommendations. And then something else I want to say a couple of words about is something we call contextuality. And that is, um, right, there are connections between language and uh, quantum at the level of tools, so you can use quantum computers. But is this connection a little bit deeper? 
So everybody agrees that natural language has a contextual data. That's why we have all these ambiguities, but it, this doesn't stop us from communicating with each other um, because we can use the context to disambiguate. And quantum mechanics was one of the first scientists, the sciences that, that had to deal with the problem of contextuality face on. So they have really nice mathematical models, including a shift theoretic model that we use to re model and reason about contextuality. So we try to use that shift theoretic model to reason about um, two word phrase level ambiguities like green cabinet. And uh, this is joint work with Daphne and she got the outstanding paper award of a quantum contextuality workshop last year. And at the moment, my other student, Ion, is trying to use the same kind of models to go to uh, the co-reference level for the Vinograd-like challenges. John called Bob, he was upset. It is a generally ambiguous reference. We don't know who is he referring to, right? It can be both Bob or John. As a result of this line of work, we found really nice connections to psycholinguistic research. I can tell you about later. So that's the nice thing, that as the impact can be generated. And that's it. That is it. Now you will put this slide. I don't know, last slide, thank you.